of the Archaeological Institute of America, the AIA, our annual lecture series. We're very pleased to have you with us again tonight. Some of you uh, are repeat customers and I recognize some faces. We're all beginning to, I hope, get relax around the post-COVID world that we're in. And um, hopefully we'll be, we'll be gaining more folks back here live. We are um, going to be doing our talks as hybrids. We've decided to move forward with this. Uh, so for those of you who um, can't make a lecture, um, some of our lectures, including our lecture this evening, is allowing us to uh, record it. We'll be able to put these on our YouTube site. Um, and, uh, and you can watch it later, um, or else you can watch it from the comfort of your own home. I have to be honest, I, I always find it's much more interesting to be here um, and get a chance to ask questions to our speaker and to enjoy um, and to enjoy time out in the community. And happily, we have this wonderful opportunity tonight, as I said, the second lecture of our series this year. Um, got it. Okay. Um, this is our 75th year, which we are celebrating. And we're very pleased to have, for many years, um, brought these lectures to the Spokane community. For those of you who are new here, we give um, six or seven lectures a year, um, usually on the third Thursday of the month. And so um, we'll be having one more coming up uh, in November. And then we take a bit of a hiatus for the holidays. And then we return in January um, and we'll have them all the way through the spring. Um, tonight's uh, talk is uh, being recorded live and recording otherwise is strictly prohibited. Um, we respect the intellectual property of our presenters and um, we ask that the viewers out there do the same. We will be recording this one, however, and so for those of you who are interested in seeing a recording, if you can't make the full talk tonight or you'd like to see it again, um, please visit the Spokane Society of the AIA YouTube webpage. Um, many of you are familiar with the AIA, but for those who are not, we're the largest uh, archaeological association in the United States. Um, we're the oldest as well. We have something like 200,000 members worldwide, um, and we support all kinds of archaeology and educational endeavors. Um, we're very proud of that. We have um, societies across the United States. Um, we're one of the older ones. Uh, which is which is nice. Um, and if you want to find out information about our society and our lectures, you can always find us on Facebook, where we've been posting for a number of years. Now, I'm very pleased to say, for those of you who have been waiting at long last, um, we do have a Spokane webpage coming soon. Um, this will have not only our talks and local events, but also local resources, as well as information about national events. So we're, um, we're, we're in the, the beta phase right now. We're sort of testing it out. It's almost ready. And I hope by our next lecture in November, I'll be able to announce that this will be our, our new site, which you can go to for all the information about what we've been up to. Um, as I mentioned, we do have the YouTube channel up, and there are a number of talks up there from last year, if you want to come and uh, catch what some of those talks are. The AIA has really embraced recording and Zoom uh, in recent years, um, and um, uh, I wanted to draw your attention to a, a flyer which is out on the table outside, um, which is a brand new series this year that the AIA has initiated. It's free. Um, it's called Archaeology Hour. Uh, there's one every month, often on the third Tuesday. Uh, the next will be on Tuesday, November 15th. Um, they're from experts across the globe on a whole range of issues. This one in particular I find fascinating. Um, Dr. Tess Davis from the Antiquities Coalition is going to talk about blood antiques, tomb raisers, uh, tomb raiders, art smugglers, and the black market in cultural treasures. Um, this is online only um, and will be at 7 p.m. So it's uh, after dinner talk. It only lasts an hour uh, and uh, there's a wide range of subjects. If you're interested in learning more, please pick up one of our flyers uh, as you leave. You can also pick up a flyer um, which has our lectures for the rest of the year. Um, and so for those of you who don't receive our newsletter, um, you can find it there. If you would like to get onto our newsletter, please let us know. Um, I should also mention that um, you'll see a flyer out there mentioning our 75th anniversary. A little teaser here. The first week of May, we are planning for a, a celebration 
um, for the AIA. We're uh, working out some details, um, but we are going to attempt to try to reconstruct the meal that uh, was found in the great Midas tumulus at Gordian, which is a site that I worked at for many years. And we're going to have a lecture from someone who works in the tomb, uh, as well as a possible meal. Anyways, we'll have more information about that as we uh, move forward into the year. Um, it, but this will be, of course, the capstone to celebrate our 75th anniversary. Uh, our speaker this evening um, is, has told me he's happy to take questions, and um, I'm sure there will be plenty because it really is a fascinating topic. For those of you at home, if you have questions, you can put them into the chat box, and we'll try to get to all of our Zoom questions as well as those from our live audience. Next month, on uh, November 17th, an old friend of mine um, and uh, an internationally known scholar of Roman law will be coming to join us, Dr. Leanne Bablitz. She's at uh, the University of British Columbia, and she's now allowed to cross the border. This has been trying to get her down here for years. And uh, anyways, she's now uh, on sabbatical. She's going to cross the border, and she's going to do a very interesting talk about Roman courtrooms. And for any of you interested in the law in the ancient world, a uh, big question has been, where do all these court cases take place? Her talk will be called, Where Have All the Courtrooms Gone? Are They Hiding in Plain Sight? And she'll be looking at the archaeological evidence for Roman law trials. Um, I think it'll be very interesting, and I hope you'll join us on the third Thursday of November. Our evening, this our, our talk this evening, um, as I think many of you know from a newsletter or perhaps something you've read, uh, or I should say perhaps something you've seen in the newspaper, um, is uh, a fascinating subject. I'm grateful to Cindy Bell for um, having brought it to my attention. I had heard about it, um, but had not known how recent this discovery actually was. And some of you might have caught it last summer. It really is a, a remarkable story. And today we have the person who for 14 years has been tracking down this story, uh, that kind of tenacious, um, I don't know, we archeologists love a good story and will worry a bone so to speak, um, for a long time trying to get at it. And um, so I'm very, very pleased uh, to be able to introduce Dr. Scott Williams um, from the cultural, he's a cultural resource program manager for WestDOT. Um, he's originally from Hawaii, um, but has connections here with Washington State with family. Um, he actually did his MA at Washington State University in Pullman. Um, he is now back on the West Side, but has agreed to come over to us to talk about this really fascinating project, and, and it really speaks for itself. So um, please, a warm welcome uh, for Dr. Scott Williams, who will speak tonight on the Galleon Santa Cristo de Burgos, Oregon's Beeswax Wreck. Okay. Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, I was going to say that was a nice description, Andy, of worrying the thing. I was going to say most people refer to it as not having a social life of spending, it's actually been 16 years on this shipwreck now. So um, I will just correct the title slide. Uh, it is not Dr. Scott Williams. I have a master's degree in archaeology, but not a PhD. This research is something I started uh, really as an interest, a side interest to my day job and have been working on uh, all these years since. So I'm going to jump into this. There we go. Uh, so I'm going to tell you tonight about our recent findings on the Manila Galleon, the Santo Cristo de Burgos. It has been historically known as the beeswax wreck, and it's a shipwreck that's been known about on the Oregon coast uh, since 1813. So pushing over 200 years now. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, there's really, with so many years of working on this project, there's a lot of information I'm gonna kind of skip over and gloss over tonight. So if you have questions, please don't hesitate to ask. But what I really wanna talk about is what has happened over the past year, because we had a pretty major find this summer. So, but let me give you a little bit of background first. So beeswax wreck, why is it called the beeswax wreck? And it's called that because the ship was carrying tons and tons of beeswax, as in somewhere between 60 to 80 tons of beeswax. And I'll get into the reasons why, but as you can imagine, when the uh, ship wrecked, the local Native Americans salvaged a bunch of the cargo and they used that beeswax. They traded it up and down the coast and inland. 
And then when the first fur traders arrived in Astoria, Oregon in 1813, sorry, 1811, they brought beeswax to the fur traders to trade. And that's how we know the beeswax is from a shipwreck because those fur traders knew there were no native honeybees in Oregon and the Indians were bringing them these blocks of beeswax. Uh, this is a picture of one of the more famous ones and it's about this big. So these are large blocks of beeswax. Uh, they brought them to the fur traders and the fur traders said, where are you getting this? Because the blocks had numbers, like you can see here, letters carved into them, symbols. And the Clatsop and the Halem Indians told them, oh, this big ship wrecked many years ago down on the beach. You want to go see it? And those first fur traders wrote about it and said a Spanish ship wrecked many years ago. Some of the crew survived and lived with the Indians for a while. So it was very well known during the 19th and early 20th centuries. It's still pretty well known on the Oregon coast. You can occasionally still find beeswax washing ashore. Uh, it, the story did sort of lose some of its broader appeal between uh, the Depression, World War II, uh, the Cold War, but we're hoping to bring it back. So I've been working for 16 years now in what we call the Beeswax Wreck Project. And this is a group of all volunteer archaeologists, historians, geologists, community members. Uh, we've organized ourselves into the Maritime Archaeological Society. So we're a nonprofit, a registered nonprofit. We have a website, it's maritimearchaeological.org. Uh, we have membership fees or membership dues, which if you pay, they're only $30 a year. Uh, then allows you to be a volunteer on one of our projects. And we offer training in underwater archaeology and site recording. And we do not just the beeswax wreck, but a variety of wreck projects in Oregon and Washington. So, and I do want to just make it real clear, this, this project is a nonprofit research project. We're going to talk a little bit about why this ship was wrecked in Oregon, what it was carrying. These are not the same kind of Spanish galleons that you read about in the Caribbean or off Florida that were carrying tons of gold and silver. These ships had a different cargo, but anything that we find, all the work we do is done through the Oregon State Historic Preservation Office and Oregon State Park. So it's all permitted through those agencies and anything we find belongs to the state of Oregon. So I'm not, I'm not here to raise money and say, hey, if you invest a thousand dollars in our project, once we find the gold, we'll pay you $10,000. Um, we're happy to have you invest in the, in the Maritime Archaeological Society, but it is a tax write-off. That money goes to help pay for um, gas for the boats, um, the research we do, and, and some of our offshore gear. So to orient you, we're going to be talking about the Nehalem Beach and River. This is in North Oregon, on the North Oregon coast. So the town of Manzanita, the town of Nehalem, uh, they're about, they're, they're just south of Cannon Beach, north of Tillamook, if you know that part of the coast. Manzanita is one of those little coastal towns kind of tucked away off Highway 101, and uh, the town of Nehalem is on the river. And what I want you to really notice in this, in this slide, this map, is the Nehalem River comes out of the north, uh, flows south, makes a 90 degree turn towards the ocean, and then before it exits into the ocean, it makes another 90 degree turn. And it actually flows for about three miles behind that large sand spit. And that sand spit is really key to understanding the shipwreck because the ship wrecked somewhere just off of this spit. And before I get into the shipwreck and what we know, just a real quick story of sort of how we know what we know. So there is a lot of historical information about this shipwreck. The fur traders first recorded it. Pretty much every ship captain, visitor, scientist to the Oregon coast in the 19th century wrote about this shipwreck because they were so fascinated with why would a ship have been carrying so much beeswax? Where did it come from and where was it going to? So we have the written histories. We also have the Native American oral histories. The story of this ship wrecking and its survivors survived all the pandemics, all the dispossession, forcing people onto reservations. And those stories were told to the first settlers on the Oregon coast. 
And then in the later 19th century, the Smithsonian sent out some anthropologists. They recorded the stories. Uh, journalists started recording them. So we have those, those oral histories of the, the Native Americans, the oral histories of the early settlers, and all the information they wrote down. So I mentioned it's called the beeswax wreck. These are some examples of some of those beeswax blocks. And um, again, they vary in size. They're, they tend to be kind of warm. Uh, they've been exposed to the ocean. They've been exposed to the sun for 300 years. The block on the upper left is a transcription of some of the symbols that have been found on the beeswax blocks. And you can see on three of these, there are symbols carved into them. And those symbols added to the mystery for those 19th century settlers because they looked at these and were like, what are these strange Kabbalistic symbols? What could they possibly mean? We know what they mean now, and I'll tell you that in just a moment, but I want to show you some of the other stuff. Besides the beeswax, pieces of the ship, pieces of its rigging, there's two wooden rigging blocks that have been found, um, a wooden wheel that we think was part of a pulley, a couple of bronze chest handles, um, that oil jar, that little silver jar is a very tiny silver oil jar from a Catholic priest's last rites set. And that little oil jar and the, the rigging block in the upper right corner were actually pulled off the shipwreck, which could be seen at very low tides just off the river mouth. So when those first settlers got there, not only did the Indians tell them, hey, a shipwrecked here many years ago, but they could actually see it. They could see it in the water. They could see pieces of it on that Nehalem spit. Um, and there's a reason why those pieces all got deposited on the spit and scattered out in the ocean. So um, that rigging block in the lower left, sorry, lower right corner, I just want to call out one of the things that has really helped our project over the last 16 years is local beachcombers, uh, local families who have found things washed up on the beach. That rigging block was found by beachcombers in 1992. They were building a bonfire on the beach. And the husband found that and he was just about to chuck it in the fire when his wife said, hang on a second, that looks like something. And thank goodness they took it to the Columbia River Maritime Museum in Astoria, Oregon. And it turns out that something is a 17th century Spanish rigging block. And we know that you can maybe just sort of see the ears in the middle there between the two holes. That's very distinctive of 17th century Spanish rigging blocks. And it was radiocarbon dated as well. In addition to those things, one thing that uh, has been washing ashore for 300 years and actually still washes ashore today is this blue and white Chinese porcelain. And as an archeologist, this was the single greatest clue to tell us which ship this was that wrecked. Um, the porcelain, you can see it's broken up. The local uh, Nehalem Indians took the porcelain and they made it into arrowheads. You can see a couple of arrowheads there. They made it into small scrapers because the original cargo that the Spanish were carrying was coffee and hot chocolate cups and plates. And the local Nehalem Indians had no use for either of those things. So they tended to break it up and uh, make it into useful tools. The great thing about porcelain like this is porcelain's a luxury good, kind of like iPhones and cars. So just how like you can look at an iPhone or an old car, you can see a car from the 50s and say, that car's from the 50s. You may not know it's a 1956 Chevy Bel Air, but you know it's from the 50s. Um, porcelain as a luxury good changed over time because uh, people would buy it as a status kind of thing. And it would be something like, okay, I bought my expensive porcelain from China. I'd have a big dinner. I'd invite you all. I'd lay out the porcelain. And then Andy would get jealous and he would save up money and he would buy porcelain of his own, but with a newer design. Then he could throw a party and be like, ha I have the latest design. Then I'd get jealous and I'd have to buy new porcelain. So that design changes uh, over time. And even though the porcelain is broken up, you can see on some of those larger pieces, elements of those designs remain. And somebody who knows Chinese porcelain, knows those design motifs, can look at all those little pieces 
and determine when that porcelain was made. And it's much more accurate than radiocarbon dating. So we had a student who studied uh, about 1,500, I guess 1,200 of these little sherds that had been found by beachcombers over the years. And she was able to say the porcelain was made between 1680 and 1700 with a mean date of 1690. So that gave us a really good clue as to when the ship wrecked. So we know from all those clues, the beeswax with those symbols on it, those symbols are Spanish shipping symbols. They're the symbols that merchants, Spanish merchants would put on their goods so that when the cargo was shipped from the Philippines to Mexico, they could keep track of the cargo. And we know the Spanish were the only European power that traded in large amounts of beeswax. And they were certainly the only group that put Spanish shipping symbols. The Chinese would trade in beeswax primarily to the Spanish, uh, but the Spanish put the shipping symbols on it. The porcelain, there's enough fragments left that we could look at it and say, this was Chinese porcelain made to export to what was called New Spain, Mexico and South America. So instead of things like teacups and uh, rice bowls, it was flat plates and coffee cups because the Spanish like to drink coffee and hot chocolate. So those clues told us it was a Manila galleon. Uh, this is a modern reconstruction of one. They were very large ships. And this trade of, of the Manila galleons went on for about 250 years. So I've already talked about, here's how we know this is a Spanish galleon, but this is that trade. And you know, a lot of us, uh, at least growing up in America, I don't know about you folks, but I'd never heard of the Manila to Acapulco trade. It was an aspect of Spanish history that we're just not taught, yet it went on for 250 years. It was the reason the Spanish had a colony in the Philippines. So a little bit of world history here, as the Europeans were starting to set out to explore and colonize the world, the Pope divided the world into two halves. He gave half of it to Portugal, and half of it to Spain because no other powers mattered at that point around 1494, I believe, 1495. Um, the Portuguese got the easy half. They got the, they got the route from Portugal uh, down around Africa, past India to the Spice Islands in Asia. The Spanish had to sail across the Atlantic, cross Mexico, cross Panama, build ships in the Pacific, and then sail to Manila to the Philippines. And that was their place to trade with Chinese merchants and get Asian luxury goods. And for from 1565 until about 1815, really the, about the only reason for the colony in Manila was to get Asian luxury goods, uh, to ship on to New Spain and to Europe. So you can see from this map that the galleons would leave the Philippines, they would sail through the Philippine Islands, and then to catch the currents and the winds, they had to sail far into the North Pacific, up to about 35 degrees north latitude, uh, sometimes up to 40 degrees north latitude. There they would catch the, the Japan current, and that would take them to the West Coast. They usually saw land right about Monterey Bay, California. Once they saw land, they turned south and they sailed to Acapulco. And once they left the Philippines, they didn't stop. They did not stop in California. There were no harbors, there were no ports, there were no missions, it was a rocky, foggy coast. So that voyage from Manila to Acapulco in a good year took six months. Sometimes it took seven or eight months. One ship took a year to make the voyage. So imagine being on a wooden ship, 150 feet long, 40 to 50 feet wide, with two to 300 other people for six to nine months. No refrigeration, no toilet facilities, um, no food preservation other than salted you know, meats, that kind of thing. So these were incredibly arduous voyages, uh, but they kept going for 250 years because they were so incredibly profitable. The Spanish had the world's largest silver mines uh, throughout the 16th, 17th, and 18th century, the only European good the Chinese wanted was silver. There was nothing else the Europeans had that the Chinese wanted. The, Span the Spanish had silver in abundance, so they would buy all these Asian luxury goods, and it was primarily the cargo was silk, 
cotton from India, cotton textiles like shirts, napkins. And we know this from the cargo manifests, uh, bed sheets, um, shawls, uh, spices, carved ivory, uh, Japanese lacquerware, that kind of stuff. So a lot of luxury goods being sold. They'd get to Acapulco, they'd sell them for a huge profit. They'd load the ship up with silver and they would sail back to Manila. The trip back only took three to four months. Much better winds, you were in a much warmer area. Um, so we know from what has been washing ashore in Oregon that the ship was an eastbound Manila galleon. It was carrying the beeswax, the porcelain, and of course, silk, cotton, and spices. Those things have not preserved. Why the ship is in Oregon, and you can see in this graphic, there's, uh, there's an X marks the spot where the ship is. It was hundreds of miles off course. And we know from the Spanish histories, uh, only one ship sailed a year. So the entire economy of the Philippines depended on that one ship getting to Acapulco. So they weren't out exploring. They weren't uh, trying to trade with the Pacific Northwest coast. They were very lost. We think maybe a storm pushed them up north, uh, but if that's the case, it pushed them very far north. So that's one of the questions we've been trying to answer is why did the ship wreck in Oregon? This is just a uh, National Geographic painting of one of these ships being loaded in uh, the Philippines. And I just throw that up there so you could see kind of that idea of they had these things stuffed to the gunnels. Um, the, the king required the ships to be armed to protect the cargo. The merchants didn't want to uh, take up space on the gun deck with cannons. So they put all the cannons in the bottom of the ship as ballast so they could fill the gun decks with cargo. One of the things they often ran out of on the voyage was fresh water because they knew they could catch rainfall during the trip. So a lot of times the merchants would chuck the water barrels over the side to add more cargo before they left the Philippines. So it was all about maximizing that profit. And we know this, the Spanish, of course, being a large bureaucratic empire, they wanted to collect their taxes. The merchants wanted their insurance. There are fantastic records that have been preserved in the archives in Spain. And so for people who can go to those records and read them, um, they provide a wealth of information. So one of the things I often forget, so I put this slide in just so I wouldn't, is why beeswax? Why was the ship carrying so much beeswax? And the reason was because there were no native honeybees in the New World. The Spanish were there with their Catholic missions and their Catholic churches. The Catholic Church required the use of beeswax candles up until 1917. World War I put an end to that. Um, but the, the church required them, the missions required them. And of course, if you were a wealthier resident, your choice for lighting was essentially beeswax, which is you know nice, bright, clean smelling light or tallow, animal fat candles. So uh, it was a cheap and easy to ship cargo from Asia. In the Philippines, you have the giant Asian honeybee, which makes giant beehives. So the Spanish would send Filipinos out as a tax, they would collect beeswax. And we know from the Spanish archives that in any given year, they were shipping somewhere between 60 to 100 tons of beeswax every single year. To the new world. So once we knew it was a galleon, we knew it was a Spanish Manila galleon, we needed to figure out which one. And despite the fact that this trade went on for 250 years and a lot of the ships sank, most of them sank either in the Western Pacific, they would hit reefs in the Philippines, they'd get caught in typhoons in the Marianas Islands or Japan, they'd get captured by Dutch or English pirates. Um, in that 250 year period, only four of the galleons that were sailing eastbound went missing without a trace. And by missing without a trace, I mean the ship set sail, it was never seen again. The Spanish would spend years looking for these ships. They would scour the islands of the Philippines. They would scour the um, Pacific coasts of Mexico, Central America, and South America, looking for the ship to try to recover the cargo. So two of those four ships were too early. We knew from the porcelain dating that our ship was a you know, late 17th, turn of the 17th century ship. So those first two, 1578, 1586, 
were too early. And it turns out one of those missing ships has been found. It's in Baja, uh, Mexico. So we have these other two ships, the Santo Cristo de Burgos, which was lost in 1693, and the San Francisco Javier in 1705. And actually, most of the English language histories of the Manila, of the Manila trade say the Santo Cristo de Burgos wrecked in the Western Pacific. Um, but as we started this project, we knew between those, those two time periods, 1693 and 1705, there was a major event on the Northwest coast. We had a giant mega quake. So probably a magnitude nine plus earthquake that caused the West coast to drop anywhere from three to six feet. And that generated a tsunami that was probably 25 to 27 feet high. So our um, initial plan was, okay, we assumed the ship wrecked in uh, 1705 after the earthquake. We knew that the Nehalem Spit, this is a picture of the Nehalem Spit in 1936. Uh, you can see it's a barren sand spit. And what would happen is the Nehalem River dumps sand into the ocean, the current migrates it to the north, the waves push it onto the beach, the wind blows it over the spit, and then dumps it in the river and the cycle repeats. So picture this spit being hit by a tsunami. It drops three to six feet, a tsunami erodes it back, a ship sails in five years later, it's gonna wreck on that eroded beach and then the beach builds back up. So we have this great model that the wreck would be buried under the modern beach. This is the beach now, you can see it's, it's overgrown. In the 1950s, it became an Oregon State Park and uh, <clears throat> Oregon Parks knew that nobody would wanna recreate on a barren sand dune so they had this brilliant idea of planting non-native beach grass and scotch broom. And uh, it's still covered in non-native beach grass and scotch broom. That has locked the dunes into place. There's also a lot of shore pines growing on it. So those dunes no longer migrate across the spit. They're now building up vertically. And that's one of the reasons no shipwreck materials have been seen since at least the early 1950s. As the dunes migrated across the spit, they would bury and expose, bury and expose beeswax and shipwreck pieces. So they don't do that anymore. Um, you can also see there's these jetties at the mouth that has caused the spit to widen to the seaward as well. So we figured, okay, the wreck is probably somewhere under that beach. So I mentioned, you know, we, we partner with a lot of people and I should really make it clear, this is not my project. Uh, I am the chief cat herder and public speaker for the Beeswax Rec Project. It's actually a group of uh, a couple dozen researchers and volunteers. Uh, this gentleman invented um, a very sensitive metal detector called a cesium magnetometer. He came out in our first year um, and let us borrow this magnetometer, which is like a $50,000 piece of equipment, which needless to say, we could not afford to buy. Um, but Sheldon uh, came out and was really excited by the project and he walked that spit, um, all five miles of it. So it's a three mile long spit plus another two miles of beach up and down with that magnetometer looking for the shipwreck. So we thought, okay, ship runs aground, it sinks into the sand, those cannons and the anchors are buried under the sand and the magnetometer will find it. We also partnered with Portland State University. Uh, Dr. Kurt Peterson brought out ground penetrating radar and we mapped the entire spit. So with that radar, Kurt could find the erosion uh, scarp or erosion cut that the tsunami made, that would tell us how far inland the tsunami uh, wave cut was and where the beach was and where the ship might have um, washed ashore. It would also tell us if the Nehalem River had ever, instead of making that 90 degree bend, come straight out into the ocean. So maybe there was a channel the ship could have sailed or drifted into. And while we were doing that work, we started seeing all these water-worn cobbles on the spit. And um, that was interesting because it's a windblown, it's a, it's a dune field, a windblown dune. And as you can imagine, the wind can't blow 
large cobbles like this. And so I asked Kurt uh, Peterson, the geologist about that. And he said, well, it's an old road. The, the locals had told them it was an old road used to build the jetty. And uh, my day job is I'm an archeologist for the Washington State Department of Transportation. So one thing I know is old roads and you don't build roads out of water rounded, poorly sorted cobbles. So I said, Kurt, it's not an old road. And then Kurt said, oh, hey, maybe it's a tsunami deposit. So um, since he was a, a professor at Portland State University, the next year we got his geology class out, we gridded off the entire spit into 100 meter squares. And we sent undergraduates to each grid point and said, record every rock you see. And we dug some test pits to see how deep those rocks were. And it turns out that what we found was it is what's called a tsunami cobble drape deposit. So picture this 25 foot tsunami washes completely over the spit. It washes up into the Nehalem River Bay and River Valley. All that water has to come back out. When it comes back out, it brings river cobbles from the bottom of the river channel. And as it washes back over the spit, the, the wave has less energy and it drops all those cobbles. So this is a map we made just basically showing the bigger rocks are up north and they, they grade down to smaller rocks towards the south. Classic tsunami drape deposit. And that was important for us because it showed us the elevation of the spit when the tsunami hit. It showed us there were no old relic river channels. Um, and this is a picture that upper layer is the tsunami layer of 1700 AD. There's another tsunami layer below it that is uh, from 1100 AD. All the sand on top of the upper layer is windblown sand. So in some places it's, it's exposed and in other places it's buried. And we were able to date that tsunami layer to confirm that it was the uh, 1700 tsunami. So now that left us, oh, and I should say, uh, Kurt was also the first one as we were studying the tsunami. We had all the historical records of where ships pieces were found, where beeswax was found. And Kurt was the first guy to say, your ship wrecked before the tsunami, not after the tsunami. And we all said, Kurt, that can't be true because the history says um, that ship before the tsunami burned in the Western Pacific. And Kurt basically said, I don't care what the history books say, the geological facts say the ship wrecked before the tsunami. So that caused us to go back to the Spanish archives where we found that that English language um, source that the ship had burned was wrong. The, the, the author had cited an earlier really obscure group of short stories written by an American expatriate in Manila in the 1920s that were clearly fiction. Um, but he had prefaced the collection with Every word of these stories are true, I swear to God. And so the, the Harvard historian went, oh, okay, they must be true, um, but they weren't. And we know that also from the Spanish records, which show the Spanish searched for the ship for six years and never found any record of it. So now we, we were faced with a problem. The ship wrecked on the beach and then the tsunami hit it. That scattered wreckage all over that spit and up into the bay. So now we realize, okay, finding the wreck is gonna be more difficult, especially because the park is overgrown. We could only do the GPR and the magnetometer in open sand dunes. The rest of the park was too overgrown to, to use those tools. So we thought, okay, the, the ship runs aground, it sinks into the sand a bit, the tsunami tears off the upper part. That lower hull is still offshore someplace. So we switched our efforts offshore. Um, we got volunteers with boats. We begged, borrowed, um, never had to steal, but we came close. Magnetometers, that's what this yellow bomb looking thing is, is it's a marine magnetometer that you tow behind a boat. Uh, and we started searching offshore for the wreck. And that's when we formed the Maritime Archaeological Society. Uh, we sent divers down um, on targets that we had found. And uh, we've been doing that for a few years, but the Oregon coast, as you can imagine, is a notoriously difficult place to dive. It's open ocean, high swells, strong currents, fog, uh, add those things into, we had to have days where the boat was available, 
three volunteer divers were available and all those weather conditions came through. So there were some summers we would get five or six dives in. There were some summers we couldn't get any dives in. We would try. We actually had guys out on the dock at 5 a.m. when we had to scrub the boat trim. Um, so while all that was going on, one of the people we worked with uh, is this gentleman, Craig Andes. Craig is a uh, local, he's a professional fisherman, clam uh, diver, an avid shipwreck enthusiast. And Craig is also a beachcomber. Uh, he is probably one of the most knowledgeable people uh, on the West Coast about where pieces of this shipwreck have been washing up, um, where the porcelain has been found. So, and Craig has shared all that information with us for the past 16 years. And in early, sorry, yeah, early 2020, um, Craig called me up and said, uh, hey, I think I found part of the shipwreck. And I said, great, Craig, we're having the annual shipwreck conference next week, let's talk about it. Uh, so we, and just as an aside, uh, February 4th, Astoria, Oregon will be the next annual shipwreck conference if anyone wants to attend, it'll be on our website. Um, but Craig said he had found part of the shipwreck uh, exposed at low tide in a sea cave. And I said, Craig, that's impossible, there's no way wood from a shipwreck could survive in the intertidal zone, you know, being exposed to air, underwater, exposed to air, where waves are pounding it for 300 years. And Craig said, nevertheless, I think I found part of the shipwreck. You need to come down and see it. March 2020, the pandemic hit. Uh, so Craig was like, oh, you got to come down. And I'm like, Craig, you're crazy. I'm not coming down. There's a pandemic going on. So this went on until... Um, Oh, July of 2020. And this gives you a, this is a view of the Oregon coast just north of the Nehalem Spit. You can see uh, to the right is Neokani Mountain, the sea cliffs of Neokani. If you've ever driven Highway 101 down the coast, you will go up over those sea cliffs. Uh, and then uh, that cove is Oswald West State Park Smuggler's Cove. And it was along this rocky coast that Craig said he'd found some of these timbers. So finally about July, uh, I was just like, Craig, I'm sorry, I'm not coming down. It's not shipwreck material. If you're so convinced, take a couple of pieces, send them to me. I will send them to a wood identification lab. And if they are anything other than dug fir, cedar, Sitka spruce, we'll talk. So Craig sent me a couple of little pieces and I sent them to a lab and they all came back as tropical hardwood, probably from Asia or South America. And I went, oh crud. Um, so the next day, one of our other uh, maritime archeology span members was down at Short Sands Beach surfing. And he said, hey, I'll, I'll go out with Craig and look at these timbers. And Craig had told me, he said, the timbers are, they're cut, they're squared off. There are spike holes in them. But you know, cell phone pictures, they're two-dimensional. Uh, the pictures he sent to me looked like rocks. The spike holes looked like boreholes from marine organisms. So I just wasn't convinced. Um, one of my colleagues went down, hiked out, called me that morning and said, oh my God, he's right. These are shaped. They are definitely ship timbers. And the, the spike holes are square. They're not round. So modern wooden ships, you bore holes with drills. You get round holes. Ancient wooden ships, you drove square iron spikes into them. So at that point, we went, oh, crud. Uh, we need to get down there and map this. We ran a radiocarbon date, and it came out right about the time period it should be for the ship. So in September of 2020, <clears throat> we went down and uh, mapped those timbers. Uh, they're exposed uh, along a rocky cliff. It's a very difficult place to access. You can only get there at an extreme low tide and you have a very limited time window to work in before you have to start hiking back to avoid being trapped by the tide. This is one of those wood beams. You can see it's the end there sticking out of a rock. It's got seaweed growing on it. It's very water worn, uh, but the parts that were more protected, you can still see the squared shape. And the reason these beams survived where they did was they were actually buried under the sand and gravel up until late 2019. So Craig had been hiking this area 
for 10 or 12 years and never saw these beams until late 2019. And when he first saw them, he thought, yeah, they're driftwood. As they eroded out more, he saw the characteristics on them. And to Craig's credit, he went, those look like shipwreck pieces. Um, so they are starting to be exposed. Some of them are starting to wash away. So we figured we better get out there, record them, and if we could collect them before they washed away. So here's another one. Some of these beams are trapped under very large boulders, which is what's been holding them in place. Uh, this is the largest beam. This is in one of the sea caves looking out to the ocean. You can see the uh, two archaeologists there are just pointing to the beam. It extends into the water there. Uh, here's another picture of it. So you can see that squared off edge and um, some of those spike holes. So we started making plans to recover the beams, but uh, the Maritime Archaeological Society is a small nonprofit. And we realized that we didn't have the resources to recover these materials, especially this beam, we estimated weighed about 250 pounds. And there was, it was seven and a half feet long and trying to carry it out of that cave was gonna to be too difficult. So um, we, I reached out to another archeologist I know, Dr. James Delgado, who's an underwater archeologist, works for a large, uh, private company called Search, but but Jim is probably the you know premier underwater archaeologist in America and one of the top three or five in the world. And luckily, Jim and I had been talking about this project for the past thirteen years. So I said, Jim, we found part of the wreck, but we can't get to it. And Jim said, Okay, I will help. Uh, Search will donate time and money. Uh, Jim talked to National Geographic, got them interested in the project. And we made plans to go recover the beams. Here's another one. You can see how water-worn this one is, but those are three spike holes in it in a row. And up close, when you look at those spike holes, they're eroded at the mouth, but down into them, they get square. And I'll show you a picture of that here in a moment. Um, so we started making plans to go recover the beams in 2021, but between having to get uh, permits from four different state agencies, um, plus COVID, by the time we got everything in place to recover the beams, it was too late. It was September. Um, the tides weren't good. Uh, COVID was ramping up. So we basically decided we would try to keep the fine quiet for another year uh, until we could come back in 2022. And we wanted to keep it quiet. Tied into the story of this Spanish shipwreck is another story on the Niacani Mountain about a buried treasure. So it's a totally separate story. But we knew as soon as we said, we found parts of a wooden shipwreck, people would say, it's the treasure ship. And they would go out there and they'd start digging, looking for the treasure. Um, we were able to keep it quiet. We went back in June of 2022 with National Geographic's help and with the help of um, uh, the Clatsop County Sheriff's Department, their high angle rescue team, the Nehalem surf and rescue team. One of our big worries is we would get out there and somebody would get hurt and not be able to hike back or we would get trapped by the tide. So we actually had the rescue team standing by to save us if we had to. Um, you can see in this picture, we got the large beam out and the plan was we would float it out. So it's wrapped in life jackets and the Nehalem surf rescue team uh, use their jet skis and rescue boards to take that out. So here's a picture. Um, they're coming in to the beach with that, that mass of life jackets is the large beam. Um, we got it onto the beach. Oregon State Parks was one of our partners. They had this little uh, quad with a trailer to get down to the beach. So we loaded that up and we took it to the Columbia River Maritime Museum. And you can see some of the holes in that beam. As I said, that's the largest one. Most of those are spike holes um, from where it was attached to the rest of the beams. Besides that big one, there was a variety of other pieces of wood. Um, some of them very water-worn and hard to tell what they were. Some of them not as water-worn. Um, this one is water-worn, but we think this is what's called a ship's knee. This is um, a support for the deck. So this would have been uh, that upper part and imagine it rotated 90 degrees. That part would have been against the side of the ship and the deck would have been on top of it. So we had definite pieces of a shipwreck. 
we knew they were old. We knew they had things like square spike holes in them. In that large beam, uh, we could see a tiny little bit of metal exposed near the end. So as I mentioned, this project, you know, it's all volunteers. The museum guys uh, took the beam to the local hospital in Astoria, and they had a portable x-ray unit, and they x-rayed the beam for us. And what you can see here from uh, right to left, that pointy thing on the right is, that, is the tip of that spike that is just exposed at the surface. We think it's bronze, which is why it didn't rust away. The two uh, bright spots are square spike holes where the iron spike rusted away, but left a concretion of iron around where the spike was. And then the other two holes, which really show as square, the spikes just completely rusted away. Um, so we were able to confirm, we do have uh, shipwreck. We do have parts uh, of the shipwreck, given the size of these beams, and um, the age, we were pretty confident they were from the, the galleon, the Santo Cristo de Burgos. We weren't 100% sure because it could have been from a later shipwreck. It could have been from a Japanese junk that washed ashore. So we took samples of the wood and we sent it to the Philippines. There's a national forestry lab in the Philippines. The first samples we'd sent to the US Forest Service in Wisconsin. Uh, the second samples we sent to the Philippines and they came back as um, a type of wood that is endemic to the Philippines that was used to build galleons. So to me, that's the, that's the proof. We actually have the galleon wreckage. So it's not like a 19th century ship built in China or a Japanese junk. It is the galleon. Um, and this is also one of the reasons we were so excited about this and we were able to get uh, James Delgado excited and National Geographic excited is there's only three Manila galleon wrecks in North America. There's the one in Oregon, there's one in California, in uh, Drake's Bay, um, and there's one in Baja, Mexico. The, the other two, the two non-Oregon ones, no wood has ever been found from, these, from those two galleons. And in fact, from Manila galleons in general, even though the Spanish kept these incredible records, they didn't keep good records of how the ships were built. We know the wood they were built out of, but there's no plans, there's no drawings, um, there's nothing to say how they were built. So only two other Manila galleon wrecks have there ever been wood found. Both of those were in the Philippines. So this was a pretty major find. It's only the third Manila galleon where wood has been found. So we have um, drawn, photographed, LIDAR scanned all those pieces of wood to send out to other galleon researchers to see if they can help us figure out, are we dealing with the lower part of the ship? the upper part of the ship, you know, port side, starboard side, that kind of thing. Um, so that was our, our big find this summer. And you know, this, this shipwreck really represents, as far as we know, uh, the first contact with Europeans on the Northwest coast. Now it's possible Francis Drake was in Oregon. Um, I firmly believe he was. The history books will tell you he was in California. Um, I will tell you as an archaeologist, there is absolutely no evidence for him in California. Um, so I think he was in Oregon. Um, but that aside, this is the first known contact with Europeans. Um, we know the ship was sailing with 234 crew and passengers. We have all their names. They were all men. We know there were survivors because the Indian oral histories tell us there were survivors. The survivors lived with the Nehalem Indians for months, um, probably or certainly um, father descendants, because there are family genealogies and histories of those shipwreck survivors. And then at some point, a fight broke out, and either all the survivors or most of them were killed. Um, but what I find really interesting, I mentioned a, um, a Smithsonian anthropologist came out in 1878 and was collecting oral histories from the Oregon coastal tribes. And his history of this ship uh, and this is what he wrote, sorry, 1877, was that the survivors resisted, throwing stones behind them and under their arms with great force. And I think that is an account of the first musket casualties on the Pacific Northwest coast. Because if you had never seen a firearm and you got shot by a lead musket ball or your friend got shot by a lead musket ball, you'd probably think it was a small stone thrown with great force. So there's a lot more in this wreck we're trying to unpack in terms of um, how the Native Americans used the cargo 
how the settlers used the cargo. They actually, there was so much beeswax, the settlers mined it as a source of income and sold it to Honolulu, San Francisco, Portland, I think Vancouver. Um, and they used the shipwreck wood. They would make furniture out of the shipwreck wood and house like door frames and things like that. So uh, we are still working on the ship. We are going to go offshore from where these timbers were found and uh, see if there is more right offshore there. Um, if there is not, we are going to expand our search and see if we can find those anchors or those cannons. Um, we've got the, the timber analysis we have done, um, and now we just need to write all this up as a report. So thank you much. I'm sorry I spoke for almost an hour, but thank you for bearing with me. Um, and I am happy to take any questions. Thank you. See if there's any from the, yeah. So any other commercial use of the beeswax, you mean by the, the Spanish or the settlers? Okay. So um, for the Spanish, it was primarily candles and, and lighting. Um, the settlers used it for anything you would use beeswax for in the 19th century, like um, waxing irons, making candles, waxing floors. The, the local Indians traded it. They would wax um, uh, canvas to waterproof it. They would use the beeswax as a a salve on wounds. So it had a lot of different uses, which was one of the reasons the Indians traded it, you know, for the, uh, boy, 100, 150 years till the settlers showed up and then the settlers sold it. Or would, they would mine it and they would melt it down and they would sell it by the pound in markets. So we don't know, we, we haven't found the cargo manifest for this ship, but from other ships of the trade, we know they shipped anywhere from 60 to 100 tons every year. Boy, I don't know, that's a good question. Um, certainly half of this room, probably floor to ceiling. You know, beeswax made a great cargo because you could store it on deck. It, you know, it was waterproof. It didn't require packaging or anything like that. So it was really at the a utilitarian cargo. Um, like the crew would ship beeswax as a way to make a little extra money kind of thing. And it floats. So when the tsunami hit, it washed it all inland, the, whatever hadn't washed away before. Yeah. Oh, so the, the significance of the numbering and the lettering, those were just owner's marks because they were shipping so much beeswax. That was a way to tell when it got to port in Acapulco, whose was whose. And so the, the other cargo had the same kind of markings on it, like the crates would have had the same symbols, but you know none of the crates have preserved. Um, I didn't talk very much besides the porcelain um, the beachcombers are finding uh, stoneware jars, Asian storage jars that would have held water, vinegar, wine. Um, those storage jars also have the symbols actually scratched into the clay as well. So they're, they're just a, a shipping label. Um, they're odd because, you know, in that period, most people couldn't read. So instead of saying like property of, you know, shipper so-and-so, it was a symbol. Um, that somebody who was illiterate could recognize. Yeah. Uh, if the wreck happened before the tsunami, what are the dates? So the, the wreck happened before the tsunami. The wreck was 1693, probably November, given the, the time it would take to cross, November or December, 1693. The tsunami struck in January of 1700. So there was a six-year period that the wreck sat, you know, in the water, on the beach, one of the two. And the thing with the Nehalem Spit is it's like a lot of Oregon beaches. Um, it's very shallow offshore and the tide range is pretty high. So depending on when the ship came ashore, if it came ashore during a high tide and storm waves, it could have been on almost dry land for most of those six years. Um, if it, and the, the galleons drew about 25 feet of water. So they had a deep draft. If it came ashore in a low tide, it would be much further offshore. 
and we just don't know yet. What makes it hard to find a ship that has wrecked on a beach like this is if it's in shallow water, let's say it's in 20 feet of water or less, it's hard to tow a magnetometer in water that shallow and you're in the surf. So you can't um, <clears throat> to tow a magnetometer, you basically wanna do a grid back and forth. Uh, in the surf like that, you have to go in towards the water and out through the waves. You can't go, because you don't wanna get sideways to the surf. So it's a very hard place to find. The um, Baja Galleon, they have found the lower hull. They're pretty sure they found the lower hull. It's in eight feet of water. And they have tried for years to get um, divers or a ship with prop wash to wash the sand away from the hull. And it's just too shallow. The waves you know, break the anchor chains. They, they send the divers left and right. So near shore wrecks are very hard to, to dive on. What you really want is a deep water wreck. You know, 60 feet or deeper would be ideal, but I don't think this one went down in 60 feet. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on, on where the timbers were found? Um, was it, were they deposited just by the current or was that from the tsunami? And can you use that to backtrack where the rock was seen? Great question. So the question was, you know, where the timbers were found, were they there from currents, the tsunami? Can we backtrack? So um, that was one of our, our key questions was what were they doing there? And um, <clears throat> we now know, because we went out this September and did a, a geological study with Kurt Peterson, those big boulders that have trapped the timbers are a, a massive landslide. And so that Kurt's reasoning is that landslide had to be shortly after the shipwreck because it's a high energy area. Now the current would, if the ship wrecked on the Halem Spit or even in um, Smuggler's Cove, the current would carry the timbers to that part of the cove, but they wouldn't stay there for years. They, you know, they would wash in one year, wash out the next probably. Um, but then you had a big landslide that trapped them in place and buried them and then preserved them for the last 350 years. Kurt has looked at the slope and the size of those boulders. And basically uh, his, his interpretation is it is likely the landslide was caused by the earthquake. We'll never really know for sure. You know, it's, it's correlation versus causation, right? Um, but probably the landslide. The, the timbers probably drifted up there as the ship started to break up. And then the landslide or the earthquake hit and the landslide came down before the tsunami hit, buried all that stuff. And then when the tsunami hit, those boulders are actually too large to move, which is why they've stayed in place for the last 322 years. Yeah. So if there is more of the wreck buried under there, getting to it is going to be very difficult for us. Kathy, you had a. I have a question about the um, so the health of the sailors. Did the Spanish have any scurvy treatment? Do you think that they had malaria and syphilis? And I, I mean, this was a long journey. Yeah. Were were, were they? They, they kind of gnarly when they hit that. Yes. So one of the reasons these ships had such large crews was they expected a good percentage of them to die of, of scurvy, tuberculosis, dysentery was huge. And, and we know that again from those records. There's also a great, there was a, um, a, a travel log that one of the first travel logs written in Europe in 1696 by an Italian merchant who was wealthy and he traveled around the world and he sailed on one of those galleons and kept a diary and wrote about it. Um, and so he, you know, he talks about how, you know, after a month, the water was all bad. Um, after two months, the food was crawling with bugs and the rats were, you know, the size of cats and things like that. But yeah, they, they had no treatment for scurvy. Um, and so between that and other diseases, anywhere from you know, five to maybe 15% of the passengers and crew died. Um, the one galleon I mentioned that took a year to make the voyage, um, it, it was overdue, obviously. So the Spanish were sailing around off Acapulco looking for it. And it came into sight one day and they're like, yay, the galleon's here at last. And it sailed right past Acapulco. So they chased it down with some other ships, got on board and everybody was dead. The sails were set, but it was a ghost ship. I mean, everyone had died of scurvy, starvation, 
other things. So it was a it was not a pleasant voyage. Most people, once they got to the Philippines, they never returned um, to Mexico for that reason. Yeah. So what kind of uh, amount of money, you know, given how long the voyage was like, what kind of profits were we talking about? We're talking 300 to 400% profit. It, it was the entire economy of the Philippines for the year. So you can imagine when one of these ships was wrecked or went missing, they spent a lot of time and effort looking for it. Um, and if they could find it, they would salvage it to get the cargo back. So that's why you know we know there's a letter from 1699, six years after the ship wrecked, um, from the governor of the Philippines, to the Viceroy in Mexico, basically saying, Your Excellency, we have looked everywhere. This thing is nowhere to be found. Um, so that's how we then started tracking down. Why did the historian in 1939 say it burned? Um, and and the, the historian in 1939 had a very specific story. Um, four survivors escaped in a small boat, um, started to starve. They drew lots to see who would be the one that was eaten. Um, so the loser was eaten, but one of the three survivors couldn't stand the thought of eating his companion, so he went over the side, the other two ate him, they got to the Philippines, the Catholic Church put them on trial for cannibalism. So pretty sensational, and you would expect in all those records, there would be a record of that trial, and there isn't. Um, so that's one of the reasons we know that the story was made up. Um, because there is no record of that trial. And certainly they weren't drifting in that boat for seven years after that letter was written. So, yeah. Would the Philippine government own by Spain? Yes. So the, the Spanish, um, there was a small group of merchants that owned, that really monopolized the trade and the church. Um, the ships were actually government ships. They, you know, they were built for the king of Spain. So that's another thing. If and when we find more of the wreck, it actually belongs to the Kingdom of Spain. Now we notified, we've been working with Spain on this find, and we have notified Spain because Spain actually has a lawyer in Washington, D.C., whose job is to protect Spanish shipwrecks and Spanish treasure. Um, so we contacted him, and, and uh, Spain is aware of the find and has essentially said, okay, it can all stay in Oregon. They don't need any of it to come to Spain. Now, if we turn around and find 10 tons of gold tomorrow, that would likely change. I think the Spanish would want that. So, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, so the question is, has the modern Nehalem tribe participated? They have, <coughs> excuse me, um, we have talked to tribal members um, and as we do all the work, we consult with the uh, federally recognized uh, Siletz tribe, which a lot of the Nehalem tribal members were either folded into the Siletz or the Grand Ronde. Because um, the area we're working is Oregon State Parks and Oregon State Lands, we work through those agencies and they, by law, they have to... Uh, consult with federally recognized tribes. So we've been talking to the Nehalem Clatsop as an aside um, on our own. And then of course, they also go through the Siletz and the Grand Ronde tribe. So yes. So yes, the, is National Geographic gonna do a special on it? They did an online article um, back in June. And they are doing a Drain the Oceans episode. So if any of you are familiar with the National Geographic show Drain the Oceans, uh, I've been told the, the episode on the galleon will probably come out December or January. It, it might be November, but probably December or January. So yeah, um, it was really, you know, it was interesting for us because National Geographic was down there filming the whole time we were trying to recover uh, these timbers and then analyzing them. Yeah. So in fact, one of those photos in the uh, slideshow was from National Geographic. Yeah. So the goods were actually bound for New Spain. Most of the cargo was sold in Mexico and Peru, uh, Mexico and, and down south to Peru. Some of it made it to Spain. Um, 
but most of it stayed in the New World. The, the people in Spain could trade with the Dutch and the Portuguese to get um, porcelain and spices and silk and stuff. So they didn't have that added expense of shipping it across the Atlantic. Um, <clears throat> but the, the trade was so successful, the Spanish merchants in Spain were always trying to get the King of Spain to kill the trade because Spanish merchants couldn't sell their goods in New Spain uh, for the, you know, at, at a price that would compete with what they could ship it over. Even with that 300% markup, it was still cheaper to ship it from China to New Spain than it was for the, the Spanish merchants to buy it from the Portuguese or the Dutch and ship it over. So they put all sorts of restrictions on the trade, like um, the ships were limited to 400 tons. <clears throat> they could not be any larger than 400 tons. This galleon was 1,600 tons that wrecked. Um, and we know that because when the king decreed, okay, you cannot build a ship larger than 400 tons, the merchants in Manila redefined the ton. They basically said, fine, that's a 400 ton ship. Our, our ton is four times the size of a European ton. So um, it's a really interesting history of economics and trade. Any other, yeah. So, so the question is, how are we authorized to do this? And is there an exclusivity? Um, we don't have an exclusivity. We're, we're really the only people, I think, crazy enough to spend all this time and our own money to do it. Um, we're authorized through the, the state permitting process. So we have to work with the State Historic Preservation Office and the, the state archeologist and Oregon State Parks. Oregon State Parks has a research permit requirement. So everything we do, we have to send in a permit to say, we, we want to do this. And then they, they either approve or, or don't approve it. Um, and, and the reason I say we're probably the only piece of people kind of crazy enough to spend this much time and money, Oregon has very strong shipwreck protection laws. So this wreck is protected under Oregon state law. Um, everything from the wreck belongs to the state of Oregon or the kingdom of Spain, but the state of Oregon is the, the steward of it. So even if we were to, let's say, find a chest of gold tomorrow, we don't get any of it. We can't sell it, we can't take it home. It goes to the University of Oregon, um, Oregon State Museum of Anthropology. So that has kept most treasure hunters away from the project. They, there's no money in it. It's a huge expense. Underwater archeology span is really expensive. Um, just in terms of the gear, the, you know, the especially when diesel fuel was so expensive this summer. So treasure hunters aren't interested at this point. Now, they could be um, if, if they thought there was, you know, 10 tons of gold on it, but most of them realize there's not likely to be that much gold. Yes, the state would own it all. So, for example, I, I got a call. One of the fun things about <clears throat> this work and being the president of the Maritime Archaeological Society is I get a lot of uh, phone calls and emails from people who, you know, they found something like a shipwreck, they found something washed up on the beach. I got a phone call from a guy who swears he knows where there's another Spanish galleon wrecked near Florence, Oregon. Um, so I'm like, great, tell me where and we'll go send a team out to look for it. And he's like, I'll tell you when you can guarantee me 50% of the treasure. And I said, I can't do that. It all belongs to the state of Oregon. He said, well, then why would I tell anyone about it? I said, well, fame, because it's cool, because you'd be doing something good for the state of Oregon. And he's just like, until you guarantee me, you know, 50%, I'm not telling anyone. I said, well, then you're not telling anyone because I can't make that guarantee and wouldn't even if I could. Yeah. Yeah, we do encourage people, you know, I, I mentioned we are, are, we owe so much to beachcombers, but we do encourage the beachcombers, if you find something, um, report it, you know, either, you know, preferably turn it in to Oregon State Parks, but at the very least report it, photograph it, send us a, an email. Um, Oregon State Parks would prefer if they didn't collect anything, but we've argued that, you know, stuff that's washing in and out with the tides if they don't collect it, it's gone. You know, I, I'm on the Oregon coast for three or four days a year. 
the beachcombers are out there every day and they can see stuff. And, and you know, like this find, if Craig hadn't reported it, I would never have looked in that, that cliff or those sea caves. Never. For one thing, I don't like to hike out there. <laughs> I mean, it's dangerous. For the other, I would have never expected shipwreck remains to survive there. And so we never would have known about that if, if Craig had not found it, reported it, and worked with us to, to show us where it was. So, yeah, Bob. Uh, other than the object of finding the location of the wreck, um, does the organization that you're working with, does it have specific research goals identified in long term? Yeah, so we, we have a couple of different research goals. Um, the, the society was really founded uh, by a friend of mine, the former president, um, who's an underwater archaeologist, and he realized neither the state of Washington nor the state of Oregon have state underwater archaeologists. And neither state actually does a very good job of tracking shipwrecks. So there's something like 3,000 shipwrecks recorded in Oregon. I think there's like 50 that are in the state database. So one of the goals of the, the society is really to research shipwrecks uh, in Washington and Oregon and try to get site forms submitted, updated. There, are, you know, we have found cases where there will be a ship wrecked, like a, um, in the state database, you know, the so-and-so wrecked here. We do the research and find, yes, the ship wrecked there. It ran aground. Then it was refloated three weeks later, sailed for another five years and wrecked in Australia. So there is no shipwreck there. So that's one of the goals. For this project, really the goal now is to see if we can find that lower hull deposit. I would love to find one of the cannons um, or an anchor off the ship, just to be able to say, if we could find a cannon, I think that would be the final, um, uh, maybe nail in the coffin isn't the right wood, but something to say, yes, it is the Santo Cristo de Burgos. If, if there was a date, the Spanish tend to use bronze cannons, not iron. So they preserve pretty well. And a lot of them have the dates of manufacture on them. So if we find a cannon with a date of um, 1703, it's not the Santo Cristo de Burgos. We're wrong. Um, but you know, if we find a date of uh, 1690, 1680, it's probably the Santo Cristo de Burgos. If we find a date of 1580, then we may have to rethink it as well. So it's always putting together those little bits of evidence to kind of tell the story. But um, yeah, I'd love to find that. Going back to the trade route as well, trade route, and it just came to me while you were talking about the cannons. Were the ships recycling, would they go west to east as well? Yes, so great question. Were the, did the ships make the full route? Yeah, so these ships were really expensive to build. And in any given year, they only had two or three operating. Um, and their lifespan was only about 10 years. For, for ships that were so important, the Spanish didn't take very good care of them. They would um, sail them to Acapulco, unload them, and then they'd sit for months. And you know they'd weather, the sails would get kind of rotten. Then they'd fix them up before they had to make the return voyage. But the, the ideal pattern was they would leave the Philippines in July, get to Acapulco in December, unload, set sail, um, I think in March, uh, back for the Philippines, get back in time to set sail again. That was the ideal pattern. Sometimes they didn't make it, so the second ship would do the voyage. Uh-huh. Was this the first voyage for the Santo Cristo to go? Great question. Was this the first voyage? It was actually the third. So the Santo Cristo was finished in 1690. It sailed to Acapulco in 1691, um, had a successful voyage, sailed back to the Philippines. It set sail again in 1692, ran into, uh, and, and it set sail with um, a, a captain who was not a sailor. He was a cavalry officer. Um, he was the nephew of the governor. So it set sail in 1692. It ran into um, a series of storms and the front mass got loose. So the captain said, let's lower that mass before it falls. And something went wrong. And we know this because it's in the archives. The mass fell and it took out the other two masts. So they drifted around for a couple of weeks, jury rigged a mast, and then, then took a vote. Should they continue on to, the, to Mexico or sail back to the Philippines for repairs? They decided to sail back to the Philippines and were promptly, the officers were all arrested 
because they didn't complete the voyage and people went broke. So they were all arrested. And one of the reasons there is so much information on this ship is those court files are still in the Spanish archives. So 970 pages of court files. Um, so the ship was repaired. The same captain um, was getting ready to sail again, except they, so these ships had four what were called pilots, the navigators, uh, because it was a very specialized trade to sail across. Um, the chief pilot was banished from Manila. The second pilot was thrown in prison. The third pilot was sentenced to the galleys. So they had the most junior pilot and then three inexperienced pilots. Um, then the captain was going to be asked to place a bond on the trip to ensure that he made it. So the captain snuck out of port, leaving 10% of his crew behind and set sail in 1693. So you have an inexperienced captain, inexperienced pilots, and they're short 10% of the crew. That's when they went lost. So they were only on their third voyage. Yeah, so it's a pretty new ship. Yeah. Kathy. So um, in 1877, you have that um, Smithsonian Anthropology yeah. on the ship. And, and, and you said, um, so they're firing a musket. You're, you're, My interpretation, yeah. Your interpretation is a musket. So, so someone came off of that ship with a musket and help. Yeah. So here, here's, here's what we think happened. The ships are so big and they are so incredibly sturdily built to survive those open voyages. We think it ran aground. Now, a storm may have pushed it ashore. There is no way, if, if enough of the crew was left alive to sail it, there is no way they would have come ashore in Oregon. So something caused them to run aground. So a storm, maybe in the middle of the night, they ran aground, although I doubt that. They tended to stop at night. That was another reason it took six months. Um, they would stop. Um, but once the ship ran aground, again, especially if it ran aground at a high tide, um, they could have walked off the ship the next morning. Um, so we think a, a large part of the cargo was probably salvaged. Um, and then it started to break up. The ship started to break up. So certainly the, some of the crew probably got off with muskets and probably their swords. And, you know, and we, we get these tantalizing um, hints of, you know, somebody dug an Indian midden site in the area in 1892 and found a Spanish helmet. But nobody knows where. And that's never to be seen again kind of thing. So, so many of the, the Oregon coastal village sites were just creamed in the early 20th century. They actually mined them for road building material. Um, so they're just gone. Yeah. From all the stories, do they have an idea? Yeah, so one story says 30, 30 men um, who were uh, not as dark as Indians, but darker than the white American settlers. So maybe Filipino. Um, or Malaysian crew members who survived. So if we ever do DNA testing, we'd actually be looking not just for Spanish DNA, but uh, Filipino and, and Malaysian as well. Um, some of the other stories just say there were survivors. Um, some of the later stories get mixed and say there was only four survivors, but that's a later shipwreck on the Oregon coast. So, you know, 30 guys would have been a little over 10% of the crew. And I should just know, if any of you have to go, um, please don't feel like you have to wait here. And I think, Andy, we have to shut down anyway, because um, the museum's going to kick us out. So thank you all for staying. Um, um, so now we have our usual raffle. We have a, a series of books that we give away, um, and we call upon our speaker. Oh.